Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We are joined today here on a special shoot at the Reynolds Industry Theater at Duke University. We're joined today by Kyle Abraham, who is the Artistic Director of Abraham in Motion. How are you doing today, Kyle? Hanging in there. Good to going? see you. Um, you're here uh, in residence uh, here at Duke University. Uh, the crew is presenting um, When the Wolves Came In. Um, Talk a little bit about this particular piece, you know, for you. Uh, I, I read an interview where you suggest that it, it's postmodern gumbo. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, some of the inspiration for this piece. Sure. Uh, so When the Wolves Came In is a kind of a, a repertory program that was part of a, a larger residency that I had at New York Live Arts mm -hmm. between 2012 and 2014. And during that time, I was creating a series of works all inspired by Max Roach's We Insist Freedom Now Suite. So creating works inspired by an album that was inspired by the civil rights movement of that era, uh, the at that time 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, and apartheid in South Africa. So trying to make a work that was referencing all of that, while also um, addressing that we were just approaching the 150th anniversary around the time that I was mm -hmm. generating these works. So what we are going to see is um, a program of three works, and there's a, a whole other kind of sister program that's an evening length work. These three works, as I was trying to expand upon my repertory, are ideally uh, works addressing the subject matter, but in totally different ways. Yeah, you mentioned the, the inspiration from, you know, the Max Rose piece, We Insist, and, and of course the great cover art there, you know, yeah. where they kind of replicate the, the Greensboro sit-in in that kind of moment, right? So I think for a lot of audiences then, they see that photo, they see that imagery, and immediately they're thinking about what's happening at that moment. You know, were there things happening right now, you know, that kind of inspired your thinking around uh, when the wolves came in? I think it was a really kind of complicated and complex um, questioning of what's happening now versus what, what has happened in the past. Uh, and when I was doing a lot of my early research and writing, the thing that was coming up for me was um, actually in reference in some ways to my first visit down here in North Carolina um, as a performer, where I think someone came up to me as an audience member and thought that um, we were, I was making, um, or dancing, I should say, I was dancing at a work by David Dorfman, um, thinking about the abolitionist John Brown. Yeah. Uh, and someone came up to me at the very beginning of the show, hadn't even really started, and someone said, oh, I bet you feel good now, I bet you feel liberated now that you have a black president. This is right <laughs> after the election. I'm like, oh, you know, I was really kind of caught off guard. Um, and it's, it's a really complicated conversation to have when we're thinking about our kind of ups and downs and our trajectory um, towards freedom, because mm -hmm. I, we're still not there. We're still mm -hmm. on our ways there. <coughs> and I think that's part of the, the beautiful irony in, the, in a song called Freedom Day that's on that Max Roach album. You know, when you're listening to the lyrics and the way in which Abby Lincoln mm -hmm. is delivering them, there is that question there, are we free? Can it really be? You know, so. Going back to the Roach piece again, mm -hmm. you mentioned Abby Lincoln, um, you know, there's an element of that recording that's very experimental, right? Mm -hmm. It's not in the pocket, you know, right. there's lots of stuff going on. Did you bring much of that experimentation that we think about from that 1960s piece into what you're doing with the piece now? Most definitely. We worked uh, with Robert Glasper and the Robert Glasper yeah, trio. Um, Sharon A. Wade is on vocals doing um, in some ways, Abby Lincoln's yeah. role. Yeah. Uh, and she was really invested, as was all of the collaborators, um, musically and visual art-wise as well, in this project. Uh, there's moments in this work where you'll actually hear um, elements of Drum Also Waltzes, which is from mm -hmm. a totally different album mm -hmm. from Drums, Unli sorry, Drums Unlimited, mm -hmm. one of my favorite uh, Roach albums. Um, and that was actually because I knew that Robert was going to be one of my collaborators. And it seemed as if something about the quality of Drum Also Waltzes had that kind of Robert Glasper vibe to it. Yeah. So there's elements like that, and then I, th I thought about this, um, this kind of historical referencing that we were hoping to do with the work, so I asked him if he could throw in a cakewalk somewhere. <laughs> so that, that kind of appears as well. There's a lot of um, experimentation that we were having in the process, and some of the kind of, I don't want to say exaggerated vocals, but some of the really experimental vocals that Abby Lincoln was doing, mm -hmm. Char Renee Wade is uh, replicating as well. Talk a little bit about the collaborators. Um, you mentioned Robert Glasper. Um, you also have visual contributions from Glenn Ligon. Yes. Uh, what was it like to, you know, you, you and three in your own right are major folks, you oh. know, in <laughs> your perspective fields. I mean, I mean, just being real. Um, 
<laughs> you know, you, you're the one with the MacArthur Genius Award. Oh, no. <laughs> but, you know, you are major figures in your own field, right? So you bring your own kind of sense of, you know, this is how I do things. Right. What was it like, you know, trying to create space for the three of you to be able to work together? You know, I had so much respect for the both of them prior to starting this project mm -hmm. that, um, you know, my first interaction with Robert was going to LA, he was in the middle, about to shoot a music video for Call, one of my favorite uh, songs, songs off of the Black Radio 2 album, mm -hmm. and um, just really vibing. We were just talking about our favorite singers and musicians, and we just had such a great rapport that I felt like we would have a comfortable conversation about yeah. how we could proceed and how we could experiment in the studio. Um, so we really connected really well right away. Uh, with Glenn, I had been a fan of his, mm -hmm. I can't even tell you for how long, um, so getting to meet with Glenn, I said to, to Glenn on our first meeting, I said, you know, if you can collaborate with me in any capacity, <laughs> it doesn't even have to be uh -huh. generating something. Even if you're just sitting in the room with me and, and giving me your advice, I'll, I'll take yeah, that's it. That's great. Yeah. Um, and that, that actually was something that was so, so key to our, the, throughout the process was Glenn's collaboration. I, I read an interview with the three of you. Um, and the author mentioned that when you raised, when she raised the question about whether or not this was a protest piece, that there was a long pause from the three of you. Um, <laughs> and of course, we can't think about the Freedom Now suite. You know, we insist without thinking about it as being distinctly pro. Right? I mean, right. the sound of it, just the the grading quality of it, that was so different in the in the sonic landscape of the time. It felt like a protest. Mm -hmm. um, is this a protest piece? And, and what does a protest piece? look like or mean, you know, in 2016? Oh, wow, that's complicated, especially, <laughs> you know, this week, you know, right. just thinking about what had happened last week in just the music world yeah. Uh, yeah. in this country <laughs> alone. Um, I, I guess in some ways you could say it is, but in the same way that I would call this a protest piece, I would say that the majority of art that is made um, is in some ways a protest of yeah. something. Uh, I think because of how this program is set up, the second and third works in particular are definitely um, re referencing a time, a, an extreme time in our history um, that I, I'm still trying to get us beyond. Uh, so in some ways there, there is a, um, a scream that is coming out. There is that, um, that um, anger, that frustration, those tears all present in the work, yeah. uh, but ideally you'll see, you'll see it and or feel it in different ways. Yeah. You're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here on set at the Reynolds Industry Theater at Deke University. We're joined by Kyle Abraham. Uh, right before tonight, Kyle Abraham and Abraham in Motion will be performing when the wolves come in. Uh, he is in residency here with some of the troupe uh, for the week here at Duke University. I, I read a really interesting piece about you, um, and it came from an I unlikely source. It, it was Jay-Z's website, right. um, Life and Times, and it actually was one of the better pieces that, that I read, and, and it made me think about a couple of things in terms of your career arc. Um, it, it, inevitably, in some of your bios, and, and this has to do in large part about when you were born, um, it's like we can't even imagine black bodies in the artistic world these days without it being somehow connected to hip hop right. in some way, right. right? So, so we get that kind of de facto reference, you know, in the context of it. Um, but I'm thinking about specifically the interview that you do for Life and Times and Life and Times' as audience. You know, how important, given how black bodies circulate in the art world, where you're more, much more likely to talk to somebody at the New York Times <laughs> as opposed to someone at Ebony. <laughs> Right. or essence, um, you know, what did it mean for you to be able to share this work or the ideas behind this work, you know, with an audience that might not know a whole lot about black dance, um, but might see someone like Jay-Z as the kind of, uh, of gatekeeper that can introduce, you know, certain forms of art to, to that audience? Sure, you know, uh, the one thing I've always said about my audience is that I hope that that audience is so diverse that mm. you have people who go to the corner store and you have the people that own the products within that corner store. Those people sitting next to each other, having a conversation and or just sitting next to each other and feeling mm. the other person's response. And it's maybe in the post-performance discussions that follow the presentation that allow people to either ask questions that maybe address issues of um, uncomfortability or allows you to hear the response 
of people who, who are um, in some ways having that experience. And I think it helps us to get to know each other a little bit more in a yeah. safer environment um, and in a way that it may challenge us, but ideally it's inspiring us regardless of our career paths. You've mentioned that in, you know, when the wolves come in is, is partially inspired by this story about you know, a child being mauled you know, by an African dog in the Pittsburgh Zoo. Mm -hmm. um, and, and thinking about that, you know, the choice to kill the animal as opposed to protecting the space better. It's almost a kind of metaphor for thinking about race right. in this country. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Because I found that particularly fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Um, you know, it, it was such a, a curious... Um, and you're from Pittsburgh. I'm born right, and raised right. in Pittsburgh, where it almost leave. <laughs> the tattoo's coming. Um, yeah, I think it was, you know, it was such a, a curious uh, situation where, you know, when a young boy falls into this pit, instead of building a higher fence, right. you kill the animal. Right. Um, that had me really thinking about a couple things. Perception was, mm -hmm. it was a big factor. And I think the way in which we look at perception in the first work that uses the title, um, the title for the whole program mm -hmm. of When the Wolves Came In, uh, that work is really primarily looking at perception. The order in which you're seeing the events may not be the way in which you mm -hmm. will right. uh, remember them. Uh, so there's that, and it also kind of allowed us to find different points of entry into movement, movement exploration. So some of the movement in that first work actually has some kind of canine or animalistic influence mm -hmm. as well. So there's a lot of different plays on how we can dive into the subject matter. When you found out that you were going to win the MacArthur, <laughs> um, what was life like before that for Kyle Abraham and what was life like afterwards? Sure, oh Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, it's, um, it was a really exciting time even before then. I think th there was a, a definite shift that had been happening from probably 2010. Uh, 2010, I was still, you know, receiving my food stamps. I was still, <laughs> my lights were still being turned off. Look, I got, I got my Bessie Award in New York. The next morning, my lights are turned off. You know, I'm like, oh, okay, it's great that I got this great award, but you know, can I get, keep my lights on? Right. You know, so it was, that reality check has always been there. But a lot of really great momentum was coming after that award, and, and um, the company started touring a lot more, both domestically and internationally. More recognition was coming about. Right. But I think that the tricky thing was once I received that award, a a lot of relief comes upon me, you know, right. knowing that I may not be in those situations for the next couple years. Yes, right. <laughs> um, ideally, I'm, I will be finding uh, a good financial strategy to make sure that that's impossible for my lights to ever right. be turned off again. <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't buy a fur house or a fur car or anything. Right. You know, I'm trying to be smart about my choices. Yeah, it's not a hundred million dollar award. No, right? <laughs> even if it is, you know, people do some ignorant stuff. I wasn't trying to go there. But, uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that happened um, is I've definitely had to grow a thicker skin a lot faster than I might, mm. uh, might have otherwise. Uh, there's a lot of questioning of my ability and my artistry um, that I had, let alone what um, people might have been coming at me a, in a much more direct way. Do you think that's something that's unique um, to black artists who get bestowed that honor um, as opposed to um, other folks who might win MacArthur's. I, you know, I, I, as an academic, uh, we talk about this all the time, this kind of imposter syndrome, right. you know, wondering that all the accolades we hear, is it really deserved, right? And then when right. you get a major award like this, you know, it, you know, are there white colleagues who experience that same thing when they get the award? <laughs> right, I, I mean, it's hard for me to say with this award in particular, based on the age in which I received it. Right. You know, being at that point in my mid-30s and receiving a MacArthur is kind of crazy. Right. Especially right. in right. dance because of how long it can take for an artist to get their work seen. Yeah. Um, you know, when we're thinking about accolades in relation to race, you know, we could go on and on. <laughs> I don't know how much tape you got, but we could go <laughs> on and on about um, how, how hard it is for us to not only receive the awards or receive even a nomination right. uh, or any kind of recognition, but to even be able to just own whatever yeah. that experience is. Uh, you know, I think about this summer when uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates won MacArthur, and, and there's a way in which 
you know, he might be like the most famous Negro to ever win one, right? You know, for, for many black folks who win MacArthur, is it, it's like it's the first time black folks will actually find out about right. <laughs> some of these folks. I, I think about the, the, the photographer, uh, the black woman from Pennsylvania who, who won it, you know, recently also. Yeah, most folks, Fraser, Latoya, yeah. most folks don't know her work and suddenly she's, she's on the landscape. Um, how important has it been for you? I know you just mentioned that you really like, you know, performing to diverse audiences. Um, I know when I used to go see Ailey, um, you know, at City Center in New York, um, how important it was always to see young black children there. Right? Right. Um, it, is that something that's still really important it's, to you? And how has vital. the residency been this week in terms of being able to connect with um, folks who aren't normally part of the Duke community? It's, it's wonderful. I think ideally, whenever we're presenting work, I want to see myself there. Yeah, I want to yeah, see myself yeah. 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I want to see someone that doesn't look like me 20 mm. years ago, 30 years ago. Um, there's so much, there's so many more possibilities for the accessibility for mm. that to happen. Mm. Um, but then again, there, it's still a struggle to make sure that that is happening. Um, you know, it, it, as much as I love the Ailey Institution, and even as someone who's made work for Ailey, mm -hmm. it's still it's still an issue for Black dancers to only ever hear the name. Oh, you're 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 going to dance for Ailey, right? You know, <laughs> there's so many other companies that ideally right. we should have the opportunity right. to dance for. Um, yes, it would be great if you can dance for Ailey, but it'd also be great if you could dance for this person, this person, right. this person. So there's still some ways to go before that can happen. I think so. The more exposure that companies like my own or other companies have the more likely that is to happen for young dancers, um, black dancers or dancers of, of any color. Uh, you know, going to your second part, uh, my time here at Duke has been really, really exciting and great for me. You know, my company has performed here um, twice previously. But ADF. At right. ADF, right. yes, but never as part of Duke's right. performing arts series. So it's great to have some kind of immersion with the students yeah. and really feel immersed in, in, in the community in that way. Uh, you know, I had a great talk. The company and I, we were talking with Tommy's class, the mm -hmm. black dance class. Mm -hmm. um, Tommy de France. Yes. Thomas de France. Yes, yeah. Thomas de France. Uh, and, um, you know, some of the dancers were teaching different dance classes for people who may maybe never studied dance before, mm -hmm. maybe studied, never studied modern dance before. And I got to watch some of that experimentation that people were having and, and the willingness and openness to take that on. Uh, and I think it really helps set up a nice conversation or a safety zone so when people are mm -hmm. seeing the work, they can feel more comfortable mm -hmm. yeah. asking questions. What's next for you? Oh, Lord. <laughs> what is next? Um, actually, I guess, thinking about what's next, one thing is actually going back to Ailey. Um, I'm in the middle of making a three-part work for um, the first company for Alvin Ailey American Dance wow. Theater. Right. Uh, I premiered the first part uh, this past uh, November, and the next iteration goes up this summer at Lincoln Center. Um, and it's a work looking at the cyclical nature of families within the prison system, wow. uh, which is a huge undertaking <laughs> to try I and take on. <laughs> uh, but working on that and then working on a new work for my company that's set to premiere in May of 2017 um, at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. Yeah. And that's a work about love and loving. So I'm really excited by the, the conversations and the um, community engagement that we're able to do with that subject matter, um, especially working with the youth. I work with mm -hmm. a lot of um, LGBT youth or youth that actually choose not to identify with any of those labels, regardless of whether or not society right. puts them on right. them, right. which is a whole other interesting thing for me coming from my generation right. um, and hearing hearing their point of view is, and hearing uh, the seniors, because we, we work with a lot of LGBTQ uh, seniors as well and bringing them together. So hearing these different points of view is just so just astounding and wonderful imagine. for me and inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. We've been thankfully joined today by Kyle Abraham, Kyle Abraham uh, Artistic Director of Abraham in Motion, a in residency here at Duke University, performing the next couple of days uh, when the wolves came in. Thank you for joining us, Kyle. Yeah, this has been an absolute me. pleasure. Thank thanks you. so much. Black lights and boots burn when I record for Watts. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything. Everything black. Culture over everything, y'all. We taking it back.